Welcome searchers and seekers. We are in the Acts of the Apostles. This is the text that is after the four Gospels in the ordering of the canon, or the canon meaning the ordering of the books. However, it's um, primarily about Peter and Paul, so it's really not the Acts of all the Apostles. Uh, Stephen is also mentioned. Uh, and Paul is really not an apostle by Luke's definition in chapter 1, verse 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went uh, in and out among us, uh, beginning from the time of the baptism at, at, with John the Baptist. So Paul doesn't really uh, fit the criteria of an apostle. So the fact that it's named Acts of the Apostles is a little, a little inconsistent with that terminology. Uh, disciples is used in this text, meaning any follower. So a disciple, uh, someone literally taught uh, and a follower of Jesus. But an apostle uh, means something more. Um, this is a, a second text by Luke. Again, we don't know who Luke was, so it was, it's an anonymous text. Uh, Luke is the name that we uh, give to this text. Uh, Luke Acts is sometimes considered um, two volumes of one work. It's addressed to Theophilus, meaning a lover of God. So Theophilus is probably not a real person's name, but just uh, means dear reader, one who, who loves God. So he's addressing it uh, to any person who fits that category. Um, it was probably written after 59 because it mentions the appointment of Festus as procurator. Uh, so it's written after 59 in the common era. And in chapter 1, it starts out, as we said, in the first book. So that means the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Theophilus, I wrote, I wrote about all that Jesus did. Again, Theophilus just meaning someone who loves God. Um, and so Jesus appeared to them for 40 days, it is said. Again, 40 days, uh, an important biblical number for a long period of time. In chapter 1, verse 20, we have this verse, For it is written in the book of the Psalms, Let his homestead become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position of overseer. Uh, so in this text, we have um, these quotes from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and they're sort of seen as proof texts or explaining uh, something or prophecies, uh, but really most of these alleged proof texts have their own meaning in situ, in their own situation. Uh, so this is really not a prophecy of this event per se. One way you could look at it um, is typologically that there are certain types in the Hebrew Scriptures that um, fit what Jesus meant to his followers. Uh, for example, Jesus is described as a suffering servant. Uh, and that goes back to the book of Isaiah and the Hebrew Scriptures. But the suffering servant really is a metaphor for Israel itself at the time that was going through a terrible historical period. And uh, Isaiah said, look, Israel is like a suffering servant at this point. Still getting things done, still meaningful, but as a suffering servant. And Christians could look at that and say, well, oh, well, that's what Jesus is, because Jesus was not the Messiah in terms of a king, but someone who suffered and was crucified. Uh, so they take that type and, and uh, say, well, look, this is how we understand Jesus. But I don't think it works to think of it in terms of a strict prophecy. Uh, because the prophecy, uh, the, the text was not really a prophecy of the Messiah who was to come, but an understanding of Israel at the time. In chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost, and there was a rush of wind filled the house, and tongues of fire appeared among them and rested over each of them. You may have seen that in imagery, so that, that's what those fires mean. Again, to understand Western art, you really need to, to understand the Bible. And really, the only way to understand the Bible is to read it in pretty much its entirety, which is what I am doing. Um, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. Um, 
I'm not even sure why that's necessary as I think about it, because this was the Greek world, and Greek was the lingua franca, the common language throughout the whole area. Uh, so there really was no need for other languages, uh, but to some extent there was. Uh, so again, we see this um, um, miracle, stories of miracles in these texts. Uh, and some of them we will see are not that believable. Uh, Peter speaks and he quotes the prophet Joel. And again, I'll say that most of what these um, readings or, or, or texts that, that which were taken from the Hebrew scriptures are not really strict prophecies of exactly what Jesus did. They're more types or metaphors, ways of understanding uh, what Jesus meant for the early Christians. In chapter 241, um, people who have heard the message are baptized, and they say that's about 3,000 persons were added. We have no historical evidence for that. That seems to be um, another example of uh, exaggeration of hyperbole, holy hyperbole, uh, in the text. And we'll see that at another place. In chapter 3, we have a story of Peter healing a beggar. And Peter says, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. So here is a healing miracle. Uh, another one of these miracles. And I think overall Acts of the Apostles does not have much theology. It's, uh, again, a book of magic and, and uh, miracles. And there's really not a lot of argumentation about how and why Jesus is the Messiah, aside from these types and these analogies and metaphors from the Hebrew Scriptures and these miracle or, or like proof miracles or signs. So nevertheless, uh, interpret it as you will. But here we have Peter performing a miracle of healing. In 3.15, Peter is speaking, and he re, uh, refers to Jesus as the author of life. So here we have a more of a high Christology, where Jesus is not just a, a human being, but identified with the author of life, a name for Jesus. In chapter 4, verse 4, um, we have another story. Uh, perhaps a doublet of um, a repeated story in some ways, but nevertheless here we have 5,000 who are converted. Again, this might be an example of holy hyperbole. In 424 we have some theology. Um, this is how um, the many of the early Christians looked at uh, God. Uh, Sovereign Lord, so Lord over all, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. So this is the idea uh, for religion here of God as a creator, God who made everything. Uh, going back uh, to the Hebrew Scriptures, Genesis verse 1, God as creator, uh, God who has made everything. In 4.32 and following, we have this idealized account of the early Christian community. No one claimed private ownership of any possessions. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as owned lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. I, I don't know how long that that would last. Uh, if, if people uh, sell what they have and that they use the money, I don't know how long that's going to last unless they have an endless supply of new people coming in. But perhaps this speaks of the apocalyptic nature of the early church, expecting Jesus to return uh, very quickly, so there's no need to keep on houses and, and property. But that will become important um, very soon uh, for two people uh, don't quite give all the money from selling their property, and we'll see what, what happens to them. Uh, so this uh, is an idea of how some early Christians behave. I don't think it's a blueprint for uh, communism or socialism or that private property is wrong, uh, but nevertheless we see that this this is how uh, they shared all that they owned. 
Chapter 5 is a rather bizarre and unbelievable story. Uh, it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, they uh, sell their property, as was mentioned in Chapter 4, some people would do, but well, both of them decide to keep some of the proceeds of selling their, their property. And that becomes a problem. And here we have Peter saying, why has Satan filled your heart? So the idea of Satan as someone who's very active, tempting people, uh, to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back, uh, keep back part of the proceeds of the land. So I think the idea here is that they were selling the land, and it's not clear in the text what they did wrong. Um, it's their property, their money. Um, I, I think the idea is that they were lying to the community, that they were holding back while pretending to sell the land and give all the proceeds. So uh, and perhaps their sin is more of lying to the community. Uh, nevertheless, um, Peter says, you did not lie to us but to God. So um, this is how some of the Christians are going to look at how they are treated, not just as representatives of themselves, but representatives of God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died, and a great fear seized the community. This is an amazing story uh, that Peter condemns him and he dies immediately. Then his wife comes in, and then Peter says something to her, and immediately she fell down and died. And a great fear seized the community. Uh, so this is a sort of an unbelievable story and here we have uh, for a community that's supposed to be known for its love uh, we already have people dying in, in the Christian church uh, for a reason of someone taking well their own money or withholding money and not giving it to the church uh, so this is, is a very bizarre story in the Acts of the Apostles and you don't really hear this story much um, but it is one of the first major events in church history. It's, it's very dramatic, uh, very difficult to accept, um, and that's all I can say. In 516, we have uh, the comment that the sick are being brought in, and they're being cured, and those are who are tormented by unclean spirits. So we have possessions that are uh, people possessed by Satan or demons and they're being exercised and then people are being miraculously healed. So very similar to the gospel stories and here we have the apostles healing and exercising just as Jesus had allegedly done. Um, and we'll see this uh, throughout, the God, uh, throughout the Acts um, and again it's more stories of miracles. There's not a lot of theology so it's uh, a religion sort of based on faith in miracles and on, on seeing these miracles. Another kind of miracle we'll see is that some of the apostles or followers are locked in prisons and we'll, we will have um, angels come in and uh, doors swing open uh, by, by themselves. And that is also found in other stories of the time, these uh, miraculous escapes from prison. In 536, um, it's an involved story, but Thutis is mentioned, and he rose up and uh, was killed. Uh, he rose up and, and um, did his own thing spiritually. Uh, he was put to death, and uh, that is actually, we know that from uh, an, a historical text from Josephus, that Thutis declared himself a prophet and led a large group of people and he was executed by the Romans in 44. In chapter 6, in the beginning, we see that there is some conflict in the Christian community. Not everything is going absolutely swimmingly. Uh, so we have these Hellenists and the Hebrews. So it appears that the Hellenists are actually predominantly Greek-speaking Jews who've become Christians, and the Hebrews are the primarily Aramaic speaking Jews who have become Christians. Uh, so one you know, might think that there's a little bit of difference there because Jesus probably spoke Aramaic 
Most of the people in Israel speak Aramaic pr prim primarily. Um, and so there, there's a cultural difference here. So there's a little bit of conflict in the community. In chapter 7, Stephen makes a speech. And this speech um, reads a sort of a brief history of the Hebrew Scriptures. You can read that and you get a sense of how early Christianity looked at um, Israelite history. Um, and they mention times where uh, the Israelites would speak against prophets um, and even Moses uh, verse 739 our ancestors were unwilling to obey him instead they pushed him inside in their hearts and they wanted to turn back to Egypt in any case Stephen is stoned um, and so he is the first martyr and they laid their coats at the feet of Saul who will be renamed Paul the Apostle Paul. In chapter 8, verse 32, we have um, some lines from Isaiah. Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, like a lamb silent before the shearer. So he does not open his mouth, and his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. So this is actually from Isaiah chapter 53. And as I mentioned before, this is Isaiah talking about Israel. Israel is having some uh, down times, some difficult times. They're being oppressed. They're in exile. And so uh, Israel's per, uh, 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 shown to be or portrayed as a suffering servant. So this is a way that, that Jesus, in a sense, looked at. Um, in a sense, is looked at. And we could say, well, look at the Hebrew Scriptures. They are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. There's lots of material there. Uh, so as the early Christians are rereading that material, they are looking uh, for signs and signals of how Jesus could be interpreted. And so uh, very appropriately, they look at the suffering servant in Isaiah. But it's nothing like a prophecy of exactly who Jesus is and how he's going to live and die. It, it has its own specific meaning in the, the time it was written. Um, it, it's not like a prophecy or a proof text. Uh, it's sort of being used like that here. Uh, but if you actually go back to Isaiah or the other prophets that are quoted, um, they don't really function as proof texts. They have their own meaning in the situation at the time they were written. In chapter 9, we have the story, a uh, very famous story, of the conversion of Saul. Um, he was going up to Damascus, which is north uh, of Galilee uh, in Syria, and he experiences a flash of light around him. He fell to the ground, and in famous pictures, he, he is portrayed as falling off a horse. So he very well could have been on a horse for a journey that long. Uh, and it was an official journey, so but it's not mentioned in the text. And after this, uh, he becomes a Christian. Uh, Jesus says, uh, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up and enter the city. You'll be told what to do. Uh, the men there traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. And that is a little different than what we see in another text where they said those were with me saw the light but did not hear the voice of one who was speaking to me that's in chapter 22 9 so there's a little inconsistency in in the story of um of paul's conversion which seems very um strange because it's a story of that kind of power you would expect uh, people who were there and, and Paul to remember exactly what happened. So chapter 9 of Acts is a big chapter because we had the conversion of Paul. Now we will also have another miracle uh, by Peter and there is a girl there um, who becomes ill and died. Her name is Tabitha and Peter says, Tabitha get up and she comes back to life. So here we have um, not just a healing story, but a resuscitation story. Uh, Peter brings 
a woman back to life. Um, this seems very difficult. I mean, you think you have to have the eyes of faith if you're going to believe that. Um, I don't believe this. I don't believe this is uh, an accurate historical story. Um, and so it's just an unbelievable uh, text. Chapter 10 is another important chapter of Peter falls into a trance and he has a dream. Uh, he sees heaven opened up and something like a large sheet or blanket coming down. In it were all kinds of creatures, reptiles, birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. So this is his dream and this will uh, play out as a rationale or reason for this dream for uh, for the idea that all peoples can be proselytized, all people peoples can become Christian, uh, no one is, is unclean, all are children of God. So that is the issue that the church is facing very early, is that who will be accepted as Christians? Well, not just former Jews, but uh, Gentiles as well. Um, any of the peoples uh, who are not Jews can become Christians. In 1034, there's a very nice universal message. Peter speaking, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So that's a very beautiful universalist kind of message. God is not partial. In 1223, we see Herod is put to death. Uh, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. So here we have uh, another of the supernatural miracle uh, occurring uh, in this text, that even various leaders can be put to death by God. In 1611, it starts out, we set sail. So now, instead of the text being third person here, or Peter or Paul did this, now it's we. So it's first person plural. So uh, the text has changed here. Perhaps this is taken from a different source. Um, so that would it would explain why all of a sudden we is there. Uh, or you could look at it as the author of the text now actually was here at this section. So it says we, but that so he says we, but that is not uh, stated. Uh, so there are various theories and ways of uh, understanding. Paul is speaking in Athens, and here we have some theology. Uh, he, he says, I found among um, the uh, uh, various places he visited an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. So here we have some, finally some theology, finally some spirituality, religion, and uh, something to work our minds around. Um, and the idea here is, that, here is that God is the Lord of heaven and earth. Uh, he does not live in shrines, does not live in, in temples, which is very different than what the, uh, the bulk of the Hebrew scriptures had believed and, and, and yet were moving away from. Um, and he makes the argument here, he's really not served by human hands because you really, God could not get anything from human hands because God made human hands. God made everything. God made human beings. Um, so he does not need anything. He himself gives to all mortals life and what is needed. So it's this idea of God as not a physical being in a temple, uh, but as creator uh, of all, including human beings. So human beings aren't there to serve God offerings uh, or uh, whatever, but uh, God exists beyond that. So here is is some theology in this text. In chapter 19, 11, God did extraordinarily, extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when uh, handkerchiefs or aprons that, he, that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, 
and the evil spirits came out of them. So even the clothing of Paul could, could do miracles. Um, and yet there were some other um, exorcists at the time who tried to use the uh, name of Jesus to exorcise demons, and that didn't work. The demons said, um, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, and so overpowered them that they fled. But yet Paul, Paul's clothes could do these miracles. In chapter 27 through 12, there is a story of Paul raising someone who had died. He was talking, and uh, someone nodded off. He fell asleep. He fell out the window and, and died. But Paul was able to bring him back from the dead. In chapter 22, we have another account of the conversion of Paul, uh, verses 6 through 11. And in this case, um, the, um, the people who are with him um, hear the voice. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. But in chapter 9-7, Paul's companions do hear the voice. So there's an inconsistency there, as we mentioned. In chapter 24-27, we have the following. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And since he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, Felix let, left Paul in prison. And the, um, the historical evidence that we have is that Felix um, was succeeded by Festus and governed about 59 to 61 AD, or the Common Era. era. So 59 to 61. So that means this text, or at least this part of the text, had to be written after 60 uh, or so. Um, so probably 30 years after the, the death of Jesus. So this um, is both historical. The uh, Acts is being historical here, mentioning that. And it also gives us um, more of a timeline uh, for when the text was written. In 26, 12 and following, we have another uh, version of the conversion of Paul. Uh, here we have Jesus actually appointing him uh, to serve and testify. So it has more details. Um, and it's also said that Jesus spoke in the Hebrew language, which would be Aramaic. Um, and says, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. Um, so um, what does that mean, kick against the goads? Well, a goad is a stick with a point in it. Um, it's used on, on farm animals to, to goad them and get them on. Sometimes the animals didn't like that. They would kick back, but then they would just injure themselves more because the goad has uh, a point on it. Uh, so that's the idea that, that Saul here, Paul, is kicking against the goad. He's kicking against what, what God wants and how God is directing him. And he's, it's only making it worse for Paul. So this is uh, a third uh, account of this, and there are some differences.